What it really takes is a family, and we as conservatives have to fight for the family. A party that desires to lead this country must have an agenda that the American people believe helps them. What is it that we can do to keep government from growing so large we can win this battle? Thank you all for being here. My name is Byron Smith. I am a board member at ISI, and I am a venture capitalist by vocation. Uh, we get to have a great panel now on the question, is Wall Street good for America? And uh, that may seem like a loaded question. People may have really different points of view about that, but we have a great panel to talk about that today. Let me introduce them briefly, and then we'll get right into it. The first is Andrew Studdiford on the end. Uh, Andrew has 29 years with National Review. He's currently editor of National Review Capital Markets, where they deal with finance and economics. He has about 40 years in international finance on both sides of the pond and um, has written extensively for the Wall Street Journal and many uh, other publications on the, the issues in finance. Um, I do have to give one quote, which I saw on a LinkedIn post that you had, uh, which is which you were talking about the investment bank HSBC, and you said, I would hope that HSBC is committed above all to maximizing risk-adjusted returns for its clients and its shareholders. Uh, that's certainly what was taught for a long time to me at the University of Chicago, but I'm not sure that all of conservatism still believes that's the right answer to, uh, to uh, some of the problems with uh, investment banks. Um, Dr. Mark Calabria, who has most recently been with the Trump administration uh, in, in his government service, um, sort of over, regulating the overseers of Fannie and Freddie, I think. Yeah. Um, chief economist for Mike Pence, senior staff over time with the U.S. Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Development. And uh, when you read uh, Mark's bio, I think um, the most important thing is, is that he grew, grew up uh, in that bastion of Austrian economics, uh, George Mason University. Um, and spent a bunch of years at Cato studying financial regulation. Um, and then <clears throat> to, uh, to um, Mark's uh, left is um, Oren Cass. Oren um, studied at Williams and Harvard and then Harvard Law and then had the good sense to say, Harvard Law is just an absolutely great place to study law. So long as you really don't want to be a lawyer, you can have a lot of fun there doing that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Oren's probably the 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 thing he's most famous for, I think, is a book which I commend to all of you. If you haven't read, I think it was uh, one of those books which you call an important book, which is The Once and Future Worker, and I think uh, basically makes the argument that if we get labor right and so, such that, that families can have great economic prosperity, that ultimately that leads to everyone's prosperity, and uh, that's the thing we should focus policy on. And he's the executive director of American Compass, and finally, Julius Krein, who also, gosh, these guys go to Harvard, but some of them turn out okay. Fortunately, he was able to study under Harvey Mansfield, the conservative at Harvard, which I think he's, he, you know, a friend of mine, uh, his son studied uh, this last semester at Harvard, and Harvey Mansfield is still there um, teaching at Harvard. Uh, <clears throat> um, he uh, then went into the belly of the beast and uh, was with Bank of America and Blackstone, but had the, had the ability to walk out of that and say Reaganomics is dead, Reaganomics has failed, uh, and is currently the editor of American Affairs. Uh, a great panel for this discussion. I want to start out by just asking the question whether not just is Wall Street good or bad, but what do we mean by Wall Street? What is Wall Street? And how do we think about it? You know, a lot of people's cult, you know, perception of Wall Street is based on movies. You know, if, if you're of my generation, it was the movie Wall Street. Gordon Gecko said the famous line, greed is good. Um, if you're from another generation, it was the Wolf of Wall Street, where I think in the same exact vein, um, the admonition was, I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich, which, you know, is just sort of a classic Wall Street line. All the books that have been written on Wall Street, um, Michael Lewis made a, about half of his career writing books on Wall Street, <laughs> from Liars, Poker, and Solomon Brothers, to The Big Short and Flash Boys, and of course recently Too Big to Fail. So Andrew, can you explain to us 
what is Wall Street? What do they do? What's, what's good about Wall Street? Maybe what's not good about Wall Street? Uh, certainly, um, uh, and I'm very glad to be here, and thank you for everyone attending. This has been a, a wonderful conference, I would just, just like to say. Um, to the list of films, movies, um, and I feel a little bit like I'm not Gordon Gecko as, as the last Reaganite slash Thatcherite. Um, um, on the movies, I would also, as it's called, King Gary Glen Ross, mm. and that, I would think, is actually a seminal uh, movie uh, for understanding, in a way, uh, a little bit about what, what Wall Street is about, although at a very retail level. And uh, I had a colleague who came over from London to work in New York, and he said, good God, what am I meant to do here? I said, get some whiskey, <laughs> um, and then watch Gungary and Ross, and that will give you a lot of understanding as to what By the way, on. get some whiskey is a good solution to most of the problems we're going to deal with today, but... I'll, that's just an aside. I'm, and a, and I'm from great, Tennessee, so that's, you know, that's our... Oh, yeah, yeah. A great product. You, you of course, have Jack Daniels down there. And um, so what is Wall Street? Good Lord. I mean, what a question. You did forewarn me, thank heavens. Um, I was asked uh, many, many years ago, um, I, one of my godchildren, aged about seven or eight, said, Uncle Andrew, what do, you, uh, what do you do? And his parents looked expectantly and said, we've always wondered... Because there is, <clears throat> there is a mystery about Wall Street. What is, it's a, it is a swamp, no doubt about that at all. But what I mean by it, and I'm sure my other panelists may disagree, is I mean basically the banks, the brokers, the investing institutions, and who all exist in this strange and not always savory ecosystem. Um, but I would, I would argue that it is an ecosystem, this Wall, Wall Street broadly defined, that has been good for America, and importantly, because they're not always the same, it's been good for Americans too. Um, is Wall Street perfect? Uh, now that, I should say, is a, rhetor is a rhetorical question. Can its excesses lead to disaster? That too is a rhetorical question. P people in the business tend to date themselves by their crisis. My, my one was 1987, actually. Uh, that was the first one that I, that I saw. But as a child, I saw the, or not child, as a uh, teenager, I saw the 73, 74 crash in the UK. And there, that was a crash. Um, so if we look at Wall Street, let's look at two items on the rap, street, on the, on the, on the rap sheet. Um, there's, let's, we can't avoid it, the global financial crisis. Greed, excess, you bet. But one thing that people forget when they're condemning Wall Street is that a key cause of that crisis was regulation. Regulators, not the bankers, designed the rules that push banks towards mortgages and mortgage-backed securities. They made those products more profitable, and they sent a message that they were safe. Now, maybe people turned a Nelsonian eye to the reality, but the fact is the role of regulation, misregulation, should not be underestimated. And the idea that Wall Street is some sort of unregulated casino, whatever area you look at it, from whatever perspective you look at it, is absolute nonsense. The problem was with the financial crisis is that the regulators guns, the, uh, like those of Singapore, were pointed in the wrong direction. Dot com, there's another moment of shame and ignominy. Uh, what, it is, what it was really was, is an example of the madness of crowds. It cost a lot of people a lot of money, but sometimes madness sort of can work in the long term. And in the ruins of the dot-com crisis, which also produced massive regulatory overkill, um, we are left with the US leadership of the internet economy. Now, not everyone here, I think, thinks that's great. I think it's fantastic. And so do the people in Brussels, they looked across jealously, and uh, what they said is they would do their Lisbon agenda. And its aim, and I'm quoting, to develop the most competitive knowledge-based economy in the world by 2010. Now, how did that work out? Uh, Top-down, centrally planned growth does not generally work well. Technocrats just aren't that good, or all-seeing. I much prefer organic, bottom-up, much more likely to deliver uh, growth. We, uh, organic, bottom-up approach. It's much more likely to deliver growth 
and there will be countless missteps and blind alleys. And that's where Wall Street comes in. Wall Street's really good at missteps and blind alleys, but it's also very forgiving and it will keep on financing. It gives the entrepreneur a chance. I uh, worked for a little while in, um, uh, in Nashville and uh, uh, alongside a venture capital firm who I think you know, um, and um, they were a forgiving lot actually. And markets, I should say, um, uh, and that second chance is a vital thing in, in America, I, I would add. And I would say that markets, to those, I think people use false, you know, create false binaries. People's, uh, no one thinks that markets is the answer to all the, all the problems. Uh, we have to work on, for example, China, and uh, automation, I think, is going to cause tremendous problems in the years to come. Uh, that's not going to be resolved by markets. To argue, to argue otherwise would be an example of the market fundamentalism I hear so much about, which is so rarely found in the wild. Amer but Americans' capital markets have proved, in my view, to be an engine of growth and an enabler of innovation. Uh, seven out of 10 companies in the world, these are 2020 statistics, uh, who spend the most on R&D are um, American. Over 70% of R&D in this country comes from private companies. Over 30% of the basic research that is done comes from private companies. People think, oh, Wall Street, uh, and again, looking at all sides, doesn't care about the long term. This is nonsense. Uh, you don't get the, the, the funding for, the, for that sort of R&D expenditure otherwise. And were the investors uh, who invested in a, a Google or an Amazon, some, certainly, we're, 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 we're looking for a short-term hit. I think it's George Soros' advice, what you do in a bubble, you buy into it. But the um, others were taking a long-term view, you know, looking for the future. And to be less utilitarian about this, Wall Street is a source, it's not certainly the, source, the only source, uh, of the human flourishing that free markets make possible. A flourishing that, in my view, ought to be central to any sensible notion of the common good. And there's something else, principle. Uh, Bakes, we've been talking a lot about principle at this conference, and I'm sure we will continue to do so. To me, a key principle is respect for private property for reasons both moral and practical. Not long after Estonia became independent, I went to see the, uh, the, the, the prime minister, a splendid fellow. His, his two heroes were uh, Margaret Thatcher and Axel Rose. <laughs> and uh, he, the privatization process was taking a long time. Being a greedy investment banker, I said, you know, I'm gonna move on, Mr. Law, Mr. Prime Minister. And he said, yeah, it's taking too long. But if we want to rebuild, but he said, we want to give back people the property that was stolen by the Soviets. And if we want to rebuild a society, we must make the point that property is someone's until they decide to, just, uh, to get rid of it, to sell it. If we don't, you won't get enterprise and you won't get thrift. And he was right, Estonia has been a huge success in that respect. Wall Street is one of the ways in which business owners can dispose of or grow their business. It's one thing to grow a business, but how in the end are you going to take your profits? And Wall Street comes in, you attract new owners. Now here's the flaw. Those who run the business need to remember, and this is something I'm sure we will discuss in more detail, need to remember that they are running it, not for themselves, but for their owners. Who are the owners? It's pretty easy. It's the shareholders. The shareholders are in it for return, mainly. That basic principle has now come under attack on Wall Street via ESG, which I don't think is a term I need to explain to this crowd, and the related concept, uh, and equally appalling, of stakeholder capitalism. Those concepts are being used to allow investment managers and corporate executives to pursue a highly politicized agenda, unconnected to investment return, and very connected to fees and accumulation of power. And if anything turns Wall Street into a menace, that's what, that's what it'll be. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to summarize. Wall Street, pretty good, pretty helpful over time, been a good thing. Mark, um, you know, 
Austrian economist, you know, invisible hand, pretty good thing, you know, government not table of central planning. I, I, I'm assuming you have some thoughts that are maybe not totally in line, but in general in line, maybe three to five minutes on, you know, what that looks like. Sure. Well, let me start out that since my, one of my pet peeves is people who starting panels with questions and then people don't answer the actual question. So I'm probably going to do this in an unsatisfactory way to answer to say, sometimes Wall Street is good for America, maybe even often, but certainly not always. Uh, and I agree with much of what Andrew said, so I won't re repeat that other than to emphasize the importance uh, of seeing Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and, and understanding why exactly coffee is only for closers. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's an important insight. But uh, I'm not going to go through the, the benefits, but I do, want, first of all, want to distinguish some, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is finance broadly, but there certainly is an important difference between a community bank and Bank of America or Goldman Sachs or a credit union or a payday lender. Uh, and we tend to wrap all of these things all together. So I'm going to first start out, mention a couple of very fundamental things that I think are critical about finance in general, and then maybe try to draw some distinctions within, uh, and then try to connect it back to some broader issues where I think there are some negatives and perhaps some, some dark side of finance. Maybe let me start out with perhaps that financial instrument most of us in the room may well be familiar with, the student loan. So let's think about finance fundamentally as a bridge to connect you from today to tomorrow. Uh, I know for myself, first person in my family that went to grad school, uh, you know, there had not, would not have been upward mobility for me or my family without the ability to go to college, but many of us probably wouldn't be able to go to college <clears throat> without a degree. So I, without a, without a loan. So fundamentally, to me, student loans are an ability to allow you to pick among multiple potential future selves. Which do I want to be, you know, if I could not have gone to school and had gotten education and do this? Of course, you can get it wrong and oversubsidize, and we've seen all these problems with student loans. But again, it's not like you want to just get rid of student loans. So again, remembering that the fundamental purpose of finance is to connect us to the future and allow us to choose among many potential futures. That doesn't mean, of course, we don't choose a bad future. Um, secondarily, you know, I fundamentally see the advance of um, society uh, is a movement from societies that are based on status to societies that are based on contract. It's easy to forget that through much of human history, your religion, your family could determine, you know, what, what you could do as an occupation. Um, and so to me, over time, finance has facilitated that move from status to contract. Pre the growth of finance, you know, family reputation made a lot of, lot of difference. I mean, my, my favorite fictional line in this, for those of you who watched Game of Thrones, is the point of a Lannister always pays his debts. Yeah. And, how, and the, the point of that is if you come from this family, and of course the <clears> probably <throat> like historical equivalent of this would be the Rothschild, where you, know, you had this network of bankers throughout the world that everybody trusted. They had an incumbent advantage because they kept their word, because you, know, you were on the line for your cousin's debts and many of these things. But the flip side of that is it creates a barrier to entry. It creates concentration, not just with the Rothschilds or with the Lannisters. Uh, and so being able to borrow, being able to tap financial markets is a critically important way to disrupt incumbents. Uh, and so I think that that's, with, without that, you would see much more concentration <coughs> in our society in terms of not just economic, but social power. Uh, and, and so I do want to see that finance fundamentally is a disruptor, uh, and that's good and bad. But to me, without that, you would have much more um, you know, rigidity. So those are, to me, are probably the fundamental benefits of, of finance. Of course, there is a, a, a dark side. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely the case where both, particularly the UK is the best example of this, but the US as well, um, the, the estimates are, for instance, that having your economy heavily dominated by finance, you know, and if you ask, you know, what does the UK actually export? The UK exports derivatives. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's fundamentally what, but what that means is when you have a heavy financial system, the whole dollar dominance of the world is based on our financial markets fundamentally. That raises the cost of interest rates. It strengthens the dollar relative to other currencies, and it makes our exports less competitive. 
So the dominance of Wall Street, and certainly it's, it would not be unfair to say that the dominance of the city, the dominance of London at UK, absolutely, undoubtedly cost manufacturing jobs in the UK. That was a cost. And again, part of what, perhaps it's just my inner economist, there are no free lunches. And personally, I probably think the UK made, a, made the right call in focusing on exporting derivatives rather than coal, but that was a cost and that was a real trade-off. Uh, we've made similar trade-offs here in the US, so there, there's no way to get around that. Um, I do think there are better ways to dial it. So for instance, to me, the fundamental problems to me in the financial markets today are, uh, the subsidies, I mentioned student loans. We've massively subsidized and distorted the student loan market. Much of that has been captured by the universities. We've clearly massively subsidized and distorted the housing market uh, and almost made it unaffordable for many people again and with too many subsidies. So A, rolling back the subsidies has to be a big part of this. But fundamentally also bringing competition to this. Uh, as Andrew uh, touched upon, you know, our financial market is that Wall Street is not a free market outcome. Citibank is not a free market institution. It is an institution that has been repeatedly bailed out. It is an institution protected by barriers to entry. For instance, today, you simply cannot get a bank charter. And in fact, if you were to go to get a bank charter, one of the things that the regulators are required by law to look at is whether you would have an adverse impact on your competitors. So it's explicitly anti-competitive. So I know as we were hearing uh, Senator Paul wrap up, I really do think that the solution to fixing the problems in Wall Street and our financial markets, of which there are many and are very real, is more competition, level the playing field, rolling back guarantees and subsidies and distortions, and actually trying to have a competitive free market and finance should be the objective. Uh, I do want to say, you know, the tension, of course, you should watch many of these, these movies that are out there, but they also have a, they, they can lead you to believe that finance is simply bad people doing bad things. Um, it's my inner economist, people respond to incentives. If you incentivize people to do bad things, they will do bad things. And it's incumbent upon the designers of the system um, to get those incentives correct. And it's also important to keep in mind, in normal markets, bad behavior gets punished and goes away. However, that doesn't happen in financial markets because we pretend to protect the bad behavior. We pretend to bail out the bad behavior. And again, Citibank is a great example of an institution that's just a horrible organizational culture. And in a normal market, they would have failed and gone away, but they've been protected and that incentivizes and reinforces the bad behavior that's there. So again, to, to summarize again, um, I think we do need a financial system. Uh, I think a financial system is fundamental to um, the freedoms we want to enjoy. It's fundamental to growth. It's fundamental to having a strong economy. But we have distorted our financial system, and the solution, again, is to have less government involvement uh, and resist a temptation to use it for our own ends uh, and again, to, to be able to have a more free market system. So those are the two rosiest views of Wall Street we're going to get today. The, it's a, <laughs> a, 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 a less, uh, less rosy view will come from uh, Oren. And, and if you read, and please do follow American Compass, uh, as well as Julius at American Affairs. Um, Oren, I'm going to start with a quote I saw. American Compass has talked a lot about what to do about this. And my favorite quote at the start of your um, long prescription for what, what, how should we go think about Wall Street <clears throat> is this, <clears throat> excuse me. The progressive approach in capitali in capitalized in Senator Elizabeth Warren's Stop Wall Street Looting Act is unnecessarily prescriptive, yet it ultimately does not go nearly far enough. So you don't think Elizabeth Warren goes nearly far enough. That leads me to believe maybe you're not as keen on Wall Street as uh, the t your f two former panelists. <clears throat> True. Well, I mean, <laughs> look, thank you for, for hosting this panel to, to ISI. I think it's, it's wonderful to see conservatives engaging in this discussion. Honestly, if, if that's the defense of Wall Street, I feel like maybe the prosecution can just rest. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the actual case for Wall Street was there. The, the things I wrote down were, you know, a lot of private companies are funding R&D in the United States. That, that of course, is not Wall Street funding R&D. That's operating companies funding R&D. 
And it's incredibly important to distinguish between our financial sector, which is mostly just trading derivatives and, and assets around in circles, and the actual productive economy that makes investments. And unfortunately, we've seen increasingly a, a disconnect between the two. Uh, and, and then Mark's initial example is student loans, which of course is a market that would not exist at all the, with, without the government's intervention. So if, if you believe that student lending would be an important function of finance, it's important to recognize that the financial markets we operate would not and do not do that. Um, I guess it seems to me that you know Wall Street could be very good for America. We need a robust financial sector. We need effective allocation of capital to productive uses. And the problem is that we don't have that today. Um, and, and so I think, you know, in, in my mind, a good way of thinking about this actually comes back to something that, that Andrew said, which, which was talking about the financial crisis and, and the idea that regulators caused it, um, which, which with respect, I think is absurd. Um, you could blame regulators for distorting outcomes in the market, causing people to pursue a different set of incentives, but that's not what happened in the financial crisis. All of those investment firms pursuing profit drove themselves into the ground, right? The regulators set up the rules, and it's not that within those rules the financial companies did a great job for themselves, it's that the financial companies failed completely. And I think it's, it's a good illustration of what we are seeing and continue to see, which is that our financial sector is badly, badly misallocating the three things we look to it to allocate. It is misallocating capital, it is misallocating talent, and it is misallocating risk. Okay, on, on the capital front, I think it's just very important to look and see that we no longer look to Wall Street to allocate capital. In fact, Wall Street is extracting capital out of the real economy. We see declines in net business investment over time. Um, my best estimate is we've seen since the Great Recession about a $3 trillion shortfall in private investment. We've gone from a situation where most operating firms take their profit, reinvest it to grow, and also give some money back to shareholders, to a situation where most operating companies, publicly traded ones, are giving so much capital back to shareholders, they're actually not investing enough even to maintain their own operations. And that's why you see things like Intel now uh, essentially ruining America's leadership in, uh, in the semiconductor industry, doing massive share buybacks while its competitors were investing in actual fabrication facilities uh, and, and getting weaker and weaker throughout the process. So I don't think we're allocating capital well at all. The talent problem, I think, is massive. We have about 30% of the top MBA program, 30% of the students in those programs going into finance, where, again, by all evidence, they are just not creating significant value for the American economy, uh, when in the past they would have been the entrepreneurs, people actually running businesses, people going into manufacturing and innovation. Uh, in fact, the share of STEM jobs in finance has roughly doubled in recent decades, while the share in manufacturing has fallen by half. Uh, and look, I don't blame them. This is a consequence of, of the differential salaries these places are paying. But that's a sign that something's really broken. And then finally, risk. We unfortunately have a system where, and, and I'm glad to see there is less of people on the right of center celebrating Wall Street as the job creators and the risk takers. But let's be clear, nobody on Wall Street is taking any risk, right? Let me know the last time you've seen someone who took a good job in Wall Street end up like, you know, losing their house, losing their car, having to go on food stamps, doesn't happen. People working at the companies that they drive into the ground have those things happen to them. But we are not at all aligning risk with reward in the way that the financial sector operates. And so I guess the last point I'd like to make is, and, and we, you know, maybe we'll get to the question of what do you do about it. We might say there's nothing to do about it, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about the nature of the problem. I think a huge hole that conservatives dig for themselves is to look at something and sort of say, well, that's a culture problem, right? Well, I, I don't know the government should intervene, so I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna put it over there. And, and even if I stipulate that there's nothing government can do about this, I would still argue it is incumbent upon conservatives more than anyone else to point it out, to say that we actually have a notion of value that goes beyond whatever generates the highest dollar profit, 
And our notion of value, our notion of justice, our notion of what is good for the nation tells us that what is going on on Wall Street in hedge funds and private equity funds is not that, right? That would be a very important thing to say. I think if we actually said it and meant it and argued for it, it would have influence on what happens in the real economy regardless of what policies we pursue. And so I think we should talk about it. One, one thing I've found most striking in, in doing this work in a couple of years is if you talk to people in the financial sector, almost every single one of them will say, yeah, that's a great point about insert other group X, but not about me. Whatever my little segment in is super valuable, but I totally agree with what you're saying about everybody else. Um, which A, raises some suspicion in my mind, um, but B, if that's what they believe, then that's fine. Right? If, if you actually believe that your segment of finance is, is valuable and others aren't, at least be willing to say that. Um, you know, Cliff Asnes at AQR is someone I have a lot of disagreements with. I really admire the work AQR has done pointing out that the entire private equity industry seems to be something of a boondoggle, just insulating uh, ineffective investment managers from their own ineffectiveness. Now, the problem for Cliff is that if you go and ask private equity about this, they'll point out that Cliff's fund has woefully, woefully underperformed just about the worst investing you could do for, for very long stretches of time. Um, but these are things we have to acknowledge. And I think if we did, uh, we would start thinking about public policy differently, and we would also shift the calculus in a lot of people's minds about what it means to actually go and do work that is, is contributing to the future of the nation. I feel like I have to confess now I am a venture capitalist and I, <laughs> what we do is very important. I'm not sure about all the other parts of the, of the financial services world. I will also add that um, you talked about uh, allocation of talent. Um, one of the scariest things I've heard recently, and I've heard it more than once, is talking to people who are in med school who say, oh, I don't want to practice medicine. I want to go work for a hedge fund or go work for a venture capital shop or go, I, I just want to get a, a degree in medicine and then it's much more lucrative to go to a insert financial institution, which is great, except for I'm 60 now and I'm gonna need doctors in the future. And so, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a concern for if me. If I could pass along a little bit, you know, I, I very much for a very long time and still have very sympathy with Oren's view of the misallocation of talent, but I'll just pass along a conversation I had recently with a friend of mine who runs one of the undergraduate programs at, at Harvard, because I'd raised this question to him, and I was like, you know, are we distorting this by encouraging all these kids to go into finance? And he looked at me and said, Mark, the, these kids aren't, that's not the creative ones. These are not the kids that were gonna go cure cancer. That's exactly what he said to me. He's like, I guess I should be a little bit more comfortable with that, but I, I actually do tend to agree. I think it's a misallocation of talent. And, and there's actually a very good study on this from, from the University of Indiana, like Indiana University, suggesting it's actually typically the most talented STEM students that are going into finance for, for what it's worth. Julius, have you been, has your mind been changed by these guys on the end? Wall Street is good for America and, uh, you know, we should feel good about it? I don't know that we took well, that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, trying to get a little I separation know, I here. It. Well, first of all, I just want to say that I thought Wall Street was a very inspirational film. <laughs> and what I especially liked about it was that uh, Gordon Gecko, in particular didn't fetishize Adam Smith or any of that other nonsense, but actually just looked at the world as it is and finance as it is. And I think that's what we need to do. And um, I've found that uh, at every panel I've ever been in, I think um, I basically had to start by complaining about the premises of the panel title. And uh, I, ISI doesn't seem like a good place to break tradition. So <laughs> I will continue to do that. I think actually it's, it's wrong to think about finance in terms of whether it's good or bad or moralize it. Um, Finance to me is more like a force of nature. It's like water rolling downhill. Uh, and we get into major problems when we try to moralize it and, and, and not look at what it is. And sometimes in some places in the past, or in, you know, people have gotten into problems for seeing finance as always and everywhere bad. And over the last 40 years or so, in the US in particular, uh, our problem has been to see finance as always and everywhere good. And so when the water rolled down the hill and it flooded the town, destroyed your house, uh, but it didn't even water the crops in the fields, somebody said maybe we should build a dam and an irrigation system. And there are certain people, you can probably guess who, 
who said, no, no one's ever done that before. You could never do that. If the rain god sent the water there, that's the absolute perfect place for it to go. And you should be thrilled, actually, that you don't have to worry about physical things anymore. Here's an iPhone, go play some video games. That's the future. I think my favorite articulation of this attitude was um, markets haven't failed us, we failed markets. Uh, but I think um, that suicide cult is dying out, as suicide cults tend to do. And if we're actually able to look at finance for what it is, we could actually channel it, and we'll need to channel it, to do very good things to solve uh, the current problems that we find ourselves in. And it may be uh, our best chance and our only chance, our only hope, given the situation of our society and our complete lack of state capacity, um, to meet the challenge of China and so on. So what do I mean by that in particular? Um, to go from the realm of corny analogy to actual reality, uh, the mistake has been both among policymakers and really across the entire economics discipline to, to conflate the maximization of financial returns with the optimization of growth, productivity gains, all the good things that you claim to want out of an economic policy. And the fact of the matter is that the two historically, presently, are empirically not strongly correlated, uh, even inversely correlated in many instances. Um, maximizing financial returns is not the same as maximizing productivity growth or overall growth, shared prosperity or whatever you want to call it, or technological innovation or anything like that. Um, it's not even the same, actually, as maximizing firm profits. And you can just look at the results of the last 20, 30 years in the United States. You don't even have to go through complicated data sets to see that in the last 20 years of secular stagnation, recession, technological stagnation, you've had phenomenal financial asset returns. The two are not the same. Once you acknowledge this, the world becomes much easier to understand and policy, while not necessarily easier to execute, also becomes much easier to understand. The problem is you need to make financial returns uh, become more aligned or realigned with the goals, the common good economic policy goals that you want, like growth and productivity, strategic industries, and so on. Um, how do you do that? Well, first, you, there has to be a policy element to this. The various policy choices we made over the last 40 years, and I've written on this, and maybe we can go through them in detail in the Q&A, have been what's made it possible for financial returns and growth to divert as much as they have in the first place. They've been a contributing factor. There's also just changes in technology and changes as the financial sector as a whole has become more professional and systematized. It better understands how to use financial engineering to maximize returns without having to go through all the difficulties and risks of safe, you know, investing in new products and growth and technologies. It's better able to separate uh, the costs of capital investment and labor costs from the rental profits of IP or other things. Uh, and that's what's led you into this. How do you fix it? Basically, um, we are slowly embarking on that process now as I think external factors have forced us into a period of sort of deglobalization and redevelopment. Uh, we're sort of stumbling around into it. It'd be nice if we could go into it intelligently. Um, but basically what you need to do, th there aren't that many tools. There's just uh, a lot of ways to think about how to apply them and think about them. One is basically conventional government grants um, to sort of make uh, certain strategic sectors or whatever more attractive to investment. Uh, this can work, um, particularly for, say, military, strictly defense things, or for really large, discrete projects, like, I don't know, semiconductor foundries. Um, but it's not ideal, um, and you lose both the kind of disciplining effect of competition, as well as the ability to really bring in uh, private sector capital that is otherwise sitting idly, um, or going into stupid leveraged crypto schemes, or making new emojis, or all kinds of dating apps, or pretending that um, office space is a tech company. And anyway. Um, the better way to do this would be actually, I think, to embrace 
the financial sector that we have and redeploy it for better purposes. And in a way, the fact that we've created a system where so much of finance uh, is set up to kind of dampen volatility and isolate uh, sort of financial returns from various risks and cyclicality and capital intensity and so forth could actually be useful. So I think the main thing that we need to think about going forward is how do we de-risk uh, certain projects that we need, for example, basically any of the big dual-use um, hard tech and manufacturing technologies that apply to both strategic defense industries as well as sort of underlying uh, applications across the economy as a whole, chips, robotics, um, you know, pharma manufacturing, for instance, 90% of our pharma manufacturing is in China and India. It's a huge problem. Um, so we can do all that, uh, and I'll, I'll, I won't go into every bit of detail for Q&A, but governments in other countries have done this by, you know, sort of matching capital, starting their own funds. I think that, pri you know, private equity finance in general, the older paradigms are increasingly running out of gas. Um, it's time to look for new stuff. They're stuck going into increasingly regulated industries, hospitals, education. It's a public relations nightmare. It's not really gonna work. Um, if we are capable of getting out of the stupid free market fundamentalist mindset, we can start thinking about how to design policy incentives to actually encourage capital to go into the industries we need to deliver the economic goals of growth, productivity, and strategic competition with China and uh, I'll end my remarks there. That was extremely helpful. You know, let me, maybe because I don't really think we've got a defender of Wall Street on the panel, I do think it's, uh, you know, I had the benefit of being on the Senate Banking Committee before the financial crisis, and, and I can certainly attest at that time that much of the Senate Republican Caucus was certainly overly influenced by Wall Street and that one of the reasons we were unable to get a number of reforms done before 2008 was that influence. So I'm going to start with, you know, definitely testifying to there has been throughout history a very strong and, in my opinion, often negative influence of Wall Street upon Republican politics, at least elected officials, and saw it firsthand. So I want to start with that and, and, and then move past that to say, I really want to thank Julius, because I think he's helped us understand, in my view, probably what the real point of disagreement is to me, which is, are we truly able to rechannel and deploy it in a way that's going to work out for us? Um, you know, sometimes people like to take shots at Milton Friedman. I, I want to start with the Milton Friedman um, quote observation I think is terrific. Somebody once asked him on a panel, why do you have so much faith in the free market? And he said, I don't, I have evidence. And that's where we need to come back to. And so let me talk about a couple of topics. Um, again, going back pre-financial crisis, uh, there was certainly a view among Republicans, and there's lots of evidence. I mean, I, I got my start working for Phil Graham. He had done a, a survey of his voters in Texas and discovered that the factor that most predicted whether someone was gonna vote for Phil Graham in Texas was whether they were a homeowner. And he therefore concluded that perhaps subsidies for home ownership weren't a bad thing, politically. I think we all saw 2008, and I think we've all seen what the housing market has done now. So that's one example, but that's not the only example. Uh, probably the, one of the most vigorous debates we had with internal to the White House, the Trump White House, uh, you know, my friend Bob Lighthizer and I would endlessly debate about the merits of XM Bank and whether we could this time use it for better. One of my kind of favorite examples of this, painfully, was we were working on something called open skies issues, where US airlines compete directly with foreign airlines. And it become, you know, I remember the meeting where I discovered uh, that all of our competition between, say, Delta United and with Air Emirates in Qatar was that XM was subsidizing below interest rate sales of Boeing planes to Qatar and Emirate Emirates to compete directly with Delta. And again, I recognize that the response of Julius and others would say, you know, we're gonna actually, we just need to do it better next time. But at the end of the day, the two biggest users of XM Bank are Boeing and JP Morgan. And I can tell you, they're there every day regardless of who's in the White House or who's on the XM board. And so I would simply say my experience is that 
if we think that we're just gonna be able to capture these institutions when we're in power and use them better than the left has, I just think we're mistaken in that regard and we'll ultimately regret it. And that ultimately our best attempt is to get rid of the subsidies, start deregulating and recognizing that all of the same things that Hayek, Friedman, Buchanan said about government are not theoretical, they are realities. I've lived it, I've been in government, I've been on the Hill, I've run an agency, I've run a White House. And again, my message would simply be, rather than indulging in the arrogance of believing that we will be better social planners than the left, we should recognize that social planning has failed. Thanks for that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna and, ask- and I actually respond, because I was, I was mentioned. Sure. Sure. I mean, people like Mark have been sitting around ranting about the Exim Bank for as long as I can remember. Guess what? They've never accomplished anything. They're still an Exim Bank. The problem, in addition to that, is not so much a question of like, well, first of all, I love that conservatives also, they do, they have all this stuff about like statesmanship and character and prudence and all of that. And then if anybody suggests something that isn't like a perfect deistic system that runs in perpetual motion by itself forever, oh no, that's impossible, it could never do that. Um, but more seriously and more substantively, the issue here isn't that there aren't difficulties of execution and there aren't a lot of trade-offs and complexities. And I'm not even saying, you know, I don't need, we can have an argument about X and Bank and whether it could be better designed or whatever, but leaving all that aside, the bigger issue is that there's no such thing as neutrality. There's no world without subsidies. They're never, it's never gonna happen, it never has happened. It's as utopian as the socialist paradise of Mars. And even if you could get rid of them all in the United States, guess what? You can't get rid of them all in China or Japan or India or elsewhere. And so what you do, what you end up having actually is instead of a conscious industrial strategy or whatever you want to call it that serves your own ends, you just have the reflection of someone else's that harms you. And you end up just sort of inversely subsidizing certain sectors, finance being one of them, that actually benefit from the Chinese strategies of uh, deindustrializing America and so forth. So neutrality isn't really a serious option. We can have a grounded empirical, empirical debate about specific policies, but if you're telling me that the ultimate goal is we're gonna to get to some perfect market neutrality, I'm sorry, that doesn't exist. Thank can, you. I, can I pick up on one other thing? Well, I guess I, two things I think are interesting. One is, I think this is a, a really good group of perspectives to address this. If your editor of National Review's Capital Matters and a fellow at Cato, um, and we don't have anyone who wants to defend the position that Wall Street is good. Um, I find that it's good sometimes. Good sometimes. Well, <laughs> so is, not to be Bill Clinton, no, but is fine. is a very helpful word here, sure. because is is present tense, right? So the question is not, can it be, is it ever, is it sometimes? The question is, right now, the way Wall Street is operating, is it good for America? Is it doing a good job? Another way we could ask it is, at the margin, if it were getting bigger or smaller, which would we say is probably a better thing right now. Certainly, I think I would say smaller. Um, Which would, I would agree with. I think at the margin, I mean, maybe to go back <clears> to Julius's <throat> point about, I don't really love the premise of the question. I mean, I mean Wall Street's like oxygen. You're, not, you're gonna die without it, but you can die at too much of it too. And, and again, you know, we have overdone it. And that's where I think there's a, agreement. I mean, I would be curious, Orrin, to get your, your take in that. Um, I largely agree with most of what you're observing. I'll say for the note that uh, you know, I brought Elizabeth Warren to speak at Cato. Yeah. So you know, not all my colleagues might have loved that, but uh, and she and I did a joint effort to try to get the Fed to roll back some of its bailout power. So again, my view is you work with whoever shares that, and I do think much of the much of the progressive criticism of Wall Street is correct. Um, but just like my view is that much of the progressive criticism of monopolies is not that they dislike monopolies, it's just they dislike the ones they don't run. And that's a fundamental difference. <laughs> uh, and so I think it's more, so I would get your, you, you didn't really touch on this, and I don't want to put you on the spot if you haven't thought through it, but um, you know, should we be rolling back the subsidies for student lending and home ownership? You know, should we be bringing more competition to our financial market? Is that a policy position we agree on? Yeah. Okay. So, so it, so it is. And, and so this is the thing I, second thing I wanted to pick up on. I mean, I think we should. I just wrote something about this point. I think 
government should be out of the student loan business entirely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but the second point I wanted to pick up on, and this goes to something that, that Julius was saying about the fact that there's no such thing as neutrality, is, is that I think where conservatives go most wrong with the sort of public choice rhetoric and concluding that, therefore, we should be for no regulation or less regulation, is that the, the public choice analysis is fine as a neutral matter, but it's there regardless of what policy we talk about. So to Julius's point that you can rail against Exim Bank, but then it's still there, public choice is going to be a factor in whatever efforts one might make to deregulate or to cut this, that that, that is the constant. And so the question is on top of that, what is the point of view we should have? What should we be trying to advance? And this is where I think the evidence is quite useful to recognize that in past eras where we had much tighter regulation of Wall Street, where we had much less of high frequency trading, leverage, you know, buyout, whatever you want to talk about, those things did not correspond to worse economic performance. In, in, fact, in fact, economic performance was much better. Economic performance, to Julius's point, on the things that we care most about has gotten consistently worse as our economy has gotten more financialized. Yeah, but and, and the one thing that, that we could most try to make a case for, I think, which is this idea that, you know, sort of these financial markets and a bigger financial sector should be bringing down the cost of capital, even that's not true. J.B. No. Morgan says the cost of capital hasn't come down in decades. And, and as corporations responding to financial incentives raise their hurdle rates, we actually see less incentive. So it, it seems to me that it, it is not an apples to apples comparison to consider the kinds of things Julius is talking about on the one hand, and then on the other hand say, but if only we could deregulate and introduce competition, that so, that would address these maybe problems. Maybe parse some of that out, and you know, we may have an XM, but you know, we don't have an infrastructure bank, and that's partly because people like myself have fought against creating a Fannie Mae for roads. That would be a disaster. And to get to the public choice, I mean, the external equilibrium is not a, not a given. Some of this is a reflection of public preferences when I first started on Capitol Hill in the early 2000s, XM was broadly praised, bipartisan, loved across the aisle. And so, you know, these are, I mean, A, I think it's important to have aspirational goals. You know, we're never gonna live in a world without violence, but I'd like to see less violence. And I don't think that means we shouldn't try to live, aspire to that. I so reckon you support public policy to try to bring about less violence, or is yes, that gonna go wrong and get captured by corporations? De depending on the topic at hand. I mean, it's got, I mean, there's certainly you gotta be the lens of but this is gonna be effective. Um, so to the extent of like, can we change the public perception and support for these things, I think is, is critical. So we're not gonna, I would just put it this way, the view within the party on XM today is night and day what it was 20 years ago. And it may be even more so 10 years from now. So some of this is how are you changing long run preferences and long run part of conversation? You know, we're not gonna get rid of this overnight. Um, and as I, and I certainly agree with you that, I mean, to me, it's part of the frustration of regulation conversation. And I was a prudential regulator. I regulated financial institutions. Unfortunately, the conversation gets me more, up, you know, more less regulation when the quality of regulation matters far more, you know, than the quantity of regulation. And we've just had very bad regulation in the past that to me has encouraged like higher leverage, it's encouraged financial crises. But I want to get what I think is a fundamental. And I want to wrap that, this part up because I want to ask one more question before we go to the audience. So quick. Right. So I just want to get to a point that I think Julius has, has, has touched on, you have touched on, which is absolutely critical. And I think certainly that the top most important things that, that Trump has done for the party is make us all look at China, you know, without rose colored glasses. And I think that's critically important. And I will be, and I will be a mea culpa and say, when China joined the WTO, I thought they were liberalized. Now I could go into some conversation about Deng, Deng versus Xi and all this, but the people who were skeptical were right about that, and we need to take that on. But the difference to me, however, is that I think the massive influence of state-owned enterprises and subsidies in China is a long-run weakness of the Chinese model and not a strength. And I'll just tell you, I mean, the, they probably would drive some of my colleagues to the White House nothing crazier than I would simply say, we cannot out China China. We have to recognize that our approach will beat China rather than us trying to mimic China. And again, I'd be the first to say that I don't think that the answers are all necessarily clear, but it is important that the party is coming together and asking that question. So I'm gonna have one final question, couple of, just 
we're going to have five minutes before we go to the Q&A from the audience, so hopefully everybody can give a short answer to this. So I've always been predisposed to believe that part of the issue is always short-term thinking versus long-term thinking, right? Economists love to say, in the long run, and then tell you what works, right? Um, you know, I've always believed that multi-generational family businesses are the greatest thing, you know, in our economy. Right? That, that that is a great thing. If you have a multi-generational family business, you have really long-term thinking. To your point, you invest in things that that matter for 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 30 years from now. The flip side of that is high-speed trading on Wall Street where, where um, mathematicians set up computers near Wall Street, they own a stock for a tenth of a second, and they are vampires sucking value out with no value added. Sorry to any hedge fund people in, in the room. Is a thing that we can agree on that having tax policy which forces a much longer term ownership of things. Is that helpful? Is What if we had really differential taxes for people that own a stock for one second versus people that own a business for a company or a stock and they think about it as owning the company for five years, right? Capital gains is a year. It's still really short term thinking. Is time an element we can use that's a simple thing or is that really not gonna help? Uh, I, I don't think it's going to, I don't think, I mean, yes, obviously the high frequency trading. And so to, to be clear, I am a defender of Wall Street, but the essence, but it's, I recognize it as a very flawed thing. But it is sort of organically flawed in many ways, and I much prefer that to anything that the state would come up, come up with, uh, which is not to say that there is not a role for the, for the state in, in, in this. Uh, dictating the term of investment, uh, the we should do more, to encourage long-term investment. I think that's right. I don't care whether shareholders buy and sell. And at the end of the day, if your investment decision is ultimately influenced by tax, the rule of thumb is that's not a great investment decision. But uh, the I'm wholly opposed to any form of financial transaction tax. Apologies there. Um, and uh, I, say, I say why. What? Why? Well, I don't, I'm not a great fan of taxes anyway. anyway. But to his but, point, what if we swapped it out? You well, could, what if you it's could a, zero you out it, the long-term capital gains rate with the revenue from a Yeah, but, 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 but essentially a financial transaction tax gums things up. It adds an actual cost. Who pays it in the end of the day is going to be, believe you me, it's not going to be the financial institutions. It's going to be their clients. And uh, I don't think throwing sand in the, the gears is, is, is the way to go. I do think that more should be done to encourage long-term investment. And uh, one way might be to, in this particularly now we have this uh, entirely due to Putin inflation at the moment, um, indexing capital gains, for example, would be a very good start. Because the longer you hold it, uh, you can, you know, we all know how tax works. You get taxed on gains which are actually an illusion. So that is, in fact, an encouragement to go short. I'm going to cut you off there so that we can just get Sorry. to a quickly. Mark? OK, I'll, I'll try to be really quick, but I'll start with an observation. One of my professors in grad school would like to say that uh, at a 10% rate of discount, seven years is half of forever. And I raise that to say, I do think it's a, I think short termism is a problem. Uh, and for instance, I, I do think that, for instance, we should go away from quarterly financial reporting, for instance, and go more to an annual system. Um, my skepticism about a financial transaction tax, and I'm not that I'm sympathetic with the objective, is I'll use the, uh, the, the parallel of the so-called vocal rule that came out of Dodd-Frank. Well, you know, this sounded really good. We don't want all this proprietary trading. We want to put taxpayers at risk. But at the end of the day, if you look at it, they carved out Fannie and Freddie securities. They carved out treasuries. And it ended up being a switch in allocation. And I'll use the other example. Um, you know, our financial system pre-2008 you had a group of extremely smart people in a room who decided that banks should not have to hold any capital against Greek sovereign debt. And of course, that's what you get when you get a bunch of finance ministers in the room. And we have to understand that a big distortion of our financial system has come out of the fiscal needs of the governments in question. And the capture of our financial system for the financing of government is a fundamental moment of the distortion. So again, it's not a theoretical, it's a, I've just seen it too many times in the room where something that really sounds like it good in theory that could work out, did get for public choice and other reasons, completely captured and distorted in a way that was worse. So I just don't believe that what would come out of the 
congressional or even treasury process for a financial transaction tax would do more good than harm. I believe it would get destructive and engineered and pick winners and losers. I don't mean to skip you, Orrin, but I know that you're for, go read uh, American Compass. He says they have good reasons on why they think uh, that this tax is uh, important. Oh, uh, no, but no, I, I know I'm running you over time, but I do want to take 30 seconds on this because it's such, this is such a concrete example, right? We're talking about within the tax code, we're talking about two different taxes. If today we were in a world where we had a financial transaction tax at no long-term capital gains rate, and I said, hey, I think we should cut that financial transaction tax because that would really help long, that would really help those investors who are paying it, and let's pay for that by raising the long-term capital gains tax, you guys would raise the exact same set of objections. You would say, oh, well, here's all these sort of public choice reasons we shouldn't do it, it would be bad. And so it's just, it's a, it's a, unhelpful status quo bias, and yet the one thing the right of center has always been most excited to jump in and do is tax reform, right? We're, we're sure we can get in there and make the tax code better, except when you actually drill down and start talking about what is good and bad in the economy and how can we make the tax code better. And this is what conservatives have to get away from. I'm glad we've made a lot of progress on the principle that we don't need to just worship whatever's happening on Wall Street as surely good for the economy, but the second step is then to recognize that the policies we happen to have in 2022 are not the God-given, neutral, not affected by public choice version, and there is every bit as much chance we can do better through reform as there is that we would make it worse through reform. Okay, I'm not, I'm, we're gonna get to questions. If you go ahead and start lining up if you've got a question. Julius, I think you think my question was just missing the point completely uh, uh, with the, the long-term ownership thing, probably, but you wanna do a 30-second answer while well, people are lining up? There, the short-term, long-term, there are significant issues with short-term, long-term issues. For example, if you look at Boeing engaging in a lot more share buybacks than capital investment um, before it found out it can't make planes that could fly. Um, <laughs> or GE, IBM, many such cases, as Donald Trump would say. Uh, but I don't even think that's the biggest issue. The biggest issue is that actually, from the perspective of financial portfolio management, investment, even over the long term, is, is like a tax on your returns. If the company has to invest in new facilities, R&D or whatever, that's costly to you. Uh, you would much rather have basically a stable asset that spins off cash and never has to do anything. What was the highest performing stock of the 20th century? It was the tobacco company Philip Morris. Why? Because it had few capital needs, it spun off cash like crazy. It wasn't IBM or Boeing or GM or any of the companies that made the American century. And it's actually that even over the long, even if you solved all the short-term and long-term things, you still wouldn't solve fundamental disincentives to investment that currently affect the shape of the U.S. economy, particularly in regard to um, you know, facing competition from China and the Asian development model. So I think the short-term, long-term thing is real but it may not even be the most important issue it's at play here. Great, thank you. Okay, questions from the audience. Start over here. All right, we're gonna start over here with a question from the app. Someone asked, and I think this is probably best directed towards either Oren or Julius, uh, what is the line between state planning and the free market? What does that balance look like? And why are the free market policies of say Singapore or Switzerland unfavorable and the state control models of the Soviet Union something to perhaps be looked into? Either of you? Julius wrote an excellent essay for American Compass, so I will, by association, claim <laughs> some credit and let him talk about it. Well, I think there's, there's never a sharp line between state and market anywhere. Um, so again, I object to the phrasing of the question. Um, but there is a difference. Um, you know, someone was talking about state-owned enterprises and stuff like that earlier. Um, which I found weird because I never brought that up as you know the course that the U.S. should go down. I suggested that we alter the incentives for private uh, financial capital allocation. Um, Singapore, of course, embraced a very conscious and intentional industrial strategy. It also has you know public ownership of hospitals and controls you know housing and all kinds of things. I don't claim to be an expert on Singapore. Um, but exactly, you know, how you do that mix uh, depends on different societies and so on. I think the right approach for the United States would be more private sector oriented 
but that doesn't mean that we cannot think about what the policy incentives for capital allocation are and, and actually pursue them rather than hide behind the sort of obfuscation of classical market theory or whatever, which no longer even apply to reality. Thank you. Next question, we'll go to the, go to the right here. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting panel, first of all. I want to say that Wall Street existed in the 19th century and it exists today. But we see very two different outcomes. Back in the 19th century, in the first half of the 20th century, the activities of Wall Street facilitated the transformation of America into the largest industrial power in the world. And right now, the same Wall Street that facilitated industrialization is transforming America into a financialized paper tiger. So why is it that the prosperity of those who make, who say greed is good on Wall Street back then, was compatible with industrialization, and right now it's transforming us into a paper tiger that is poised to lose to China? Thank you. Mark, you look like you were chopping. Well, I was, to get was, that was one. listening and then thinking through it. I mean, I, I would certainly say I think the difference is, and we can certainly have a broader debate whether you know, the railroads at the time were the Fannie Mae's and state-owned enterprises. And, and again, this is, I mean, Julius does raise an incredibly important point, which we will always live in a mixed economy. I, I don't think anybody necessarily would disagree with that. But where I would say the distinction between Wall Street today and Wall Street, say, 120 years ago, is that Wall Street 120 years ago was relatively competitive, was relatively unregulated and unsubsidized. And instead today we live with a Wall Street that you know, has been pretty much, there is almost no dividing line between Washington and Wall Street. Uh, and so I do think that's a distinction. Um, so I do think that that's a big reason of why at one time it was a big driver of growth and while it wasn't another time. I will, however, since I knew you were gonna try to cut me off earlier, just take the, the privilege of, uh, the point of privilege and, and, and say, I think one of the incredibly important things we did for definancialization in the 2017 tax reform, of which our principles were lower and simpler, is we did reduce the subsidization of interest in borrowing that goes in the tax code on both the corporate and individual side. So I do think that tax simplicity, and my view is the 2017 tax reform was a great win uh, and was an important improvement in that regard of capital allocation increasing without picking winners and losers, at least not overly. I think we have time for one more question. My name is Nancy Spanis. I wrote a book called Hamilton versus Wall Street, um, the core principles of the American system of economics. And um, I'm really happy with this panel. I'm a great fan of Oren's, his article from April uh, 2021, Everyone Should Read, which is concretely talks about Wall Street. But the key thing which is indicated in my book is that historically it's the principles of Hamilton and industrial policy and government guiding of the economy which made this country great, not Wall Street. Wall Street under control. And I um, am very curious about the opposition to the infrastructure bank since the fact is that Banking, the use of public debt in a national bank was key to the concept of Hamilton, Lincoln, and others who grew this economy. That's it. Thanks. Could I pick up on this? And I should kind of sort of pose a follow-up question to Mark. Sure. So uh, I, I think it, the, the point about how, you know, Wall Street functioned very differently in the first half of the 20th century, say, versus more recently is incredibly important. The, the distinction between a Wall Street that was fundamentally gathering up capital and deploying it into the productive economy as the way to generate returns versus one that is mostly more involved in sort of yeah. sec buying up and trading the existing assets, incredibly important and I think destructive transition. I'm just perplexed by your critique that this is somehow a function of Regulation, Like, I understand the generic critique that when something bad is going on, we say that's because of government regulation. But I would love just to hear you connect the dots between what, what are the regulations in place that are leading Wall Street to 
behave one way versus the other. And we have about 30 seconds left <laughs> on the panel. Well, let me very quickly say, I do think that the time where Wall Street went off the rails was actually you know, when we closed the gold window and you, because you didn't have all these interest rate derivatives and all these needs before the 70s when we had relatively, here's where I disagree with Milton Friedman. I, I think we need to go back to a relatively more fixed exchange rate system than the floating, but that's a whole different other conversation. Where Wall Street is distorted is the capital standards, you know, the whole Basel regime where, okay, you don't hold any capital against treasuries, you hold very little against Fannie and Freddie's, you hold very little. I mean, what is punished in our bank regulatory system is for instance, holding small business loans. Yep. Our regulatory system punishes you making loans to small businesses and it rewards you as a banker for making loans. That's why today the loan to deposit ratio for banks is at a historic low. Why? Because we through the regulatory system have encouraged banks to put our deposits and our savings in government debt and in Fannie and Freddie debt and not in small business. So the capital regulation, the Basel regime is the most distortionary aspect and that's probably what we need to fix most of all. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for this panel. I really appreciate all your insights, and uh, thank you, ISI. Thank you.